Thank you for inviting me to speak. I am a smack virgin. Uh, I've never been to a smack conference and I have never spoken at a smack conference. So here goes. I hope it goes well. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, learning to love frailty. It dovetails very nicely with uh, what Simon said and some of the stuff that Michelle was talking about. This is our bread and butter. As much as we may not like to think so, it is actually what we do every day. The emergency department that I work in is a major trauma centre. We see around 350 patients a day on average. And uh, a lot of what we talked about this morning is not stuff that I recognise that I do. So I don't do thoracotomies very often. I don't do cricothyroidotomies. I don't do hysterostomies. And uh, I do do some major trauma, but actually most of my time is spent managing minor illness, minor injury, and the elderly. That is my bread and butter. And um, when I was a lot younger, um, I wanted to do ENT as a profession. And somebody said to me, if you want to be an ENT surgeon, you have to like taking wax out of people's ears, because that's what you do a lot of. And um, so I decided to become an emergency physician. And actually, one of the things that you have to learn to love is uh, the elderly. So this is Chris, one of my colleagues, and uh, this couple here were a classic. He fell on top of her, and they both turned up. Bless them. And uh, they sat in the corridor because there was nowhere else to put them in a wheelchair, which I was very pleased to see, rather than uh, a trolley. And uh, Chris was attending to them in a very kind and humane way. This is not a sexy topic. There are very few gizmos and gadgets. There are targets, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. And uh, this may not be something that interests Scott Weingart, but um, it is something that should interest us all. But some of it's very tedious. It's about looking at patients' toenails and thinking, their toenails and their feet are absolutely disgusting. Why is that? It's not just because they want them to be that way. It's because there's a problem. And it's actually looking for clues to help us manage patients better who are frail. What I first want to talk about, I wouldn't be an academic without giving you a little bit of evidence, so I'm sorry about this, but I want us to think about how big is this problem and how big is it becoming and what are we doing about it at the moment. And then we'll move on to think a little bit more about how we could do things better. Like Michelle, I have no answers for you, but I can give you a bit of evidence and I hopefully can stimulate some thought about how we could do this better because it is my hypothesis at the moment, we are not doing this well at all. So, this is some data I've been working on recently, and um, this represents about a million ED attendances, a three-year period, and this is data from Yorkshire, where I'm from, the centre of the universe, and um, it basically is a very mixed urban-rural area, uh, some very large EDs like mine and people in Leeds, some smaller rural EDs, and uh, so there's a real mixed picture going on here. And what we did was break down our patients, oops, beg your pardon, by age uh, here, and the, the circle represents the bottom three lines, which are the patients who are aged over 65. And as you can see, in terms of attendances, they represent about a quarter of our attendances over this three-year period that, that we were looking at. Uh, so, not a huge number of attendances in this age group. Uh, many of them, though, arrive by ambulance, so almost two-thirds of them are arriving by ambulance. So, there's something about the role that the ambulance service has in managing these patients, which we'll come on to. Do these patients really need to come? Um, we looked at whether these patients had what we would describe as a necessary or an unnecessary attendance. An unnecessary attendance was a patient who comes to the ED, they have no investigations, they are prescribed no treatment, they are not admitted to hospital, and they are not referred to any other specialty in the process of their journey. 
And as you can see, the older the patient gets, the more necessary their attendance is. So here, the numbers are large. Here, they're very small in terms of the unnecessary nature of their attendance. When we compare to the younger age group, we're looking that's much more around 20% of those patients could perhaps be seen and treated elsewhere. And this is all about debulking our departments and reducing crowding. Do they all get admitted? So in the over 65s, just over 50% of them are admitted to hospital. So two-thirds come by ambulance, half are admitted to hospital. There must be a guideline or a kind of decision tree in there somewhere that we need to work on. And how's their experience? Well, as many of you will know, and many of us have lived through, we have the four-hour target in the UK. So at the moment, we should see and treat 95% of our patients in a four-hour window from when they book in to when they leave. And uh, we've, I've done loads of work on this. And uh, this is one of uh, the famous charts that I've shown before, which this is four hours. And we've split the patients into those under 65 and those over 65. And as you can see, there's this huge spike in the last 20 minutes before we hit four hours, when everybody panics and tries to get patients out of the department so they don't breach. And as you can see, for the elderly over 65, around 20% of them get moved somewhere in the last 20 minutes before four hours. This is not good patient care, this is not quality care, and this is certainly not satisfactory for any of us. We also know that these elderly patients generally spend an hour longer in the ED than their younger counterparts. Probably this is because more of them are admitted to hospital, and we suffer from exit block in our EDs, so we can't get them out. And is this changing? Well, over the three-year period that we looked at, we could see that attendances gradually were going up and admissions were gradually going up, and this was significant. But what's most interesting here is that around 40 or just over 40% of over 65s are actually admitted for a very short period of time, less than 48 hours. And I started to think, well, is this really good? I mean, is there something else that we could do to, A, prevent that admission and save some money, and also give the patient a better experience? What are we trying to do when we admit patients? What are we trying to do with them in the ED? As Simon showed, as patients get older, their problems become much more chronic and impossible to cure. They have circulatory problems, respiratory problems, cancer. What can we do about these things in the ED? It's very, very difficult for us to manage these patients and actually do something positive for them. My name is June Andrews. I'd like you to just watch I'm this for a few minutes. I hope you find it this interesting. This is the story of my trip to hospital. It started one Friday evening when I had a fall in the bathroom. My husband called the out-of-hours doctor, who told us to call 999. Arthur couldn't help me get back up on my feet. I had a nasty bruise over my right hip. I wasn't keen on coming into hospital, but they persuaded me. I was on call when Mrs. Andrews was brought in, and I arranged a hip X-ray. There was no fracture, but some blood and urine tests showed that she was a little dehydrated and had a possible water infection. Mrs Andrews was moved on to the acute medical unit. She was getting close to breaching the four-hour target. It was also getting late and the AMU was a safer place to assess her and get her back on her feet. We put up a drip and gave her some antibiotic tablets for the urine infection. On Saturday morning, she was seen by the on-call medical consultant. Before we could look at her mobility, the patient flow team insisted we move her to the first available medical bed. She was not reviewed again medically till Monday. There is no routine physiotherapy or occupational therapy over weekends, so we couldn't refer her to the home rehabilitation team before then. By Monday, June had been on either a trolley or in a bed with the cot sides up for three nights because she was deemed to be at high risk of falls and the nurses had inserted a urinary catheter. She was seen that Monday morning by the physiotherapist who got her out of bed with the aid of a Zimmer frame. My home ward is in the elderly care unit. 
We do our best to provide a regular liaison service to other wards, although we wish the doctors there had more knowledge about managing older patients. The ward doctors and occupational therapists made a plan to get some more information about June's usual abilities and past medical history. I'm June's husband. On Monday, I was able to get back into the hospital to see her on the ward. I told the ward doctors and nurses that June had been getting more unsteady recently, had suffered another fall, and that her memory isn't what it used to be. The review team discovered that her blood pressure was dropping very low when she stood up, postural hypertension. It often leads to falls and faints in older people. We stopped a couple of her cardiac medications to try and solve this problem. By Wednesday, she was able to stand with assistance. The physios came to see her and a plan was made to refer her for ongoing rehabilitation in the local community hospital before going home. But not for the first time, there were no community beds and by the 10th day of June's admission, the cardiology ward desperately needed beds for acute cardiac patients and she was moved to a winter escalation ward. After all those moves, Mrs Andrews had become confused and agitated. She had another fall, sprained her wrist, and now she required two nurses to transfer her from bed. June spent increasing time in bed with the cot sides up. By day 12 of her admission, the community hospital phoned back saying that she had no rehab potential and should have a care package instead. She was referred to social services with a target discharge date for Friday, but the package couldn't be put in place till the following Tuesday. She went home with a three times a day care package, but with no clear diagnosis for her progressive memory impairment and falls. Seven weeks after her discharge from hospital, June had fallen twice more. Her memory was worsening and Arthur was becoming stressed, concerned and exhausted. June ended up being admitted for respite to a local care home. Mrs Andrews never got back to her own home after her respite. We should have more care and support for older people like her outside hospital and those services need to respond much earlier to people's needs. But the way we treated her in hospital and our difficulty getting her back on her feet and home again didn't help. With so many frail older people coming into hospital, we have to get this stuff right for everyone. Okay, we have to get this stuff right for everyone. And whilst Mrs Andrews had some potential underlying problems, we certainly did not do her any favours at all by keeping her in hospital. And there are several opportunities there to curtail the journey and to take Mrs Andrews down a different path. So, was the admission avoidable? Now, we could talk about that, and I'm sure we'll have a variety of views about whether this lady needed an admission to hospital to manage her fall, or whether she needed further investigation for her fall, or whether those things could have been done in the community. I'd like to just look at some of the evidence to review the possibilities around a different journey for her. Falls are common, and most people who fall will fall again and again and again, and eventually some of them will die as a result of their falls. What are we trying to do with these patients? We cannot cure them from falling completely. We may be able to assist the process and uh, make sure we have uh, we, we have any treatable medical problems, make sure that they have uh, an environment that's more uh, frail safe, as it were. So, can the ambulance service do more? What should be happening in the pre-hospital setting? There have been a number of studies now looking at uh, the management of falls by ambulance services or other professionals in the community, and this is just one example. It's actually a study that I did. Uh, where we took paramedics and we trained them in uh, assessing and managing elderly fallers specifically. Uh, they would go into the home when the patient had fallen, they would assess them for injury, illness, and they would treat any minor problem and leave the patient at home. The study involved nearly 4,000 patients, in fact nearly 5,000, 
And what we found was it actually reduced uh, ED attendance by these patients uh, by 25%. One of the things we hadn't anticipated was that it actually therefore reduced subsequent hospital admissions by 6%, which was highly significant. And this had a knock-on cost saving, as Michelle uh, was talking about. This is not a bottomless pit. We have to draw the line somewhere. And this actually saved money because it saved bed days. M more patients didn't die, uh, and actually we found the service to be completely safe. These were fairly low level problems that these elderly patients had, uh, and certainly we did not cure their falls, but uh, satisfaction with the service was very high. What's the evidence from the hospital? Well, comprehensive geriatric assessment is the buzzword, and uh, this approach to managing the elderly with a multidisciplinary team has been uh, trialled in the ward setting, in the acute setting, and not in the ED. Um, and a number of studies have shown that this seems to benefit patients, so outcomes are improved, hospital stay is shortened, uh, and uh, complications are also much better. However, should we be doing this in the ED? And the evidence is really mixed at the moment, so when we've looked at it, we've tried to kind of classify it into those interventions that just occur in the ED. So what could we do in the ED that's going to change the journey for that patient? And basically, it would appear to me that no one's really done anything in the ED. So no one's tried to put a package into the ED and actually evaluate it. The only thing I could find was having a pharmacist in the ED to look at medications and particularly look at polypharmacy in these patients and to try and tweak that where possible. Where the ED initiates something by, for example, discharging the patient to have an assessment in the community, which may include a CGA approach or a falls or specialist nurses, then this does seem to have been evaluated, although the evidence, again, is really mixed, and only two studies showed any benefit whatsoever. Many of the studies were underpowered and quite small. Observation and assessment wards, most of us have these nowadays, we should be using them. The studies that have used them and put in a CGA-type approach in there have shown some reduction in readmission and reattendance by these patients. So should we all be doing this? Should we all be trained up and much more savvy about how we manage these patients? Or should we, as I think Michelle was alluding to, become a subspecialty interest group? Should we be passing this on to our specialist colleagues in geriatric medicine? Uh, how should we be doing it? And it may well be that a variety of approaches are correct here. I don't know, actually. I, my instinct is we need all to be taking ownership of this. We need to learn to love these patients, and we need to be able to deal with them, because 24-7, we are the people who are there and treating them in the ED. So how should we be treating them? Well, you may disagree with me, but I have a very light-touch approach with these patients, particularly the very frail, the over 85s. What are we trying to do? So I walk in there saying, what can I do for this patient? And I look at their toenails, and I smell them, and I look at how clean they are, and I look at whether they're coping at home, and I talk to them. I have a colleague who says that taking a history and examining a patient is a Victorian parlour game. We don't do that anymore. We just put them through the CT scanner. Now, you see, Michelle talked about this, and actually, fundamentally, for this, pa this patient group, I think that is completely wrong. Yet I have many younger colleagues, I've been knocking around for a few years, but I have many colleagues who are younger than me who who just cannot resist using uh, gadgets and gizmos to investigate these patients. So they put them on a trolley when they arrive, which is the first thing, as you saw with Mrs. Andrews, that I think we should not be doing unless they are acutely unwell. Most of these patients do not need to be on a trolley. They should be in a chair. They should be encouraged to mobilize as and when they can. The longer they sit on a trolley, which is for many hours in my department, the more difficult it will be to get them home because they become stiff, dehydrated, weak, and very quickly immobile. Amal Matu taught me a great thing. He said, most of these patients coming through your door will all be dehydrated, 
you'll do no harm at all by just giving them a litre of fluid. And I routinely do that now, and I think it works brilliantly. Particularly if they have a drop when you're measuring their blood pressure. And uh, many of the junior doctors come to me and they'll say, oh, they've, they've got a drop. Uh, we're doing a line of standing blood pressure and there's a drop. We need to admit them. So I'll say, have they had anything to eat and drink? Don't know. Right. Well, we'll put them on the observation ward, give them something to eat and drink, and make sure that they have it, even give them some IV fluids, and then let us check it again. Because is it a real thing, or is it just because they've been deprived of food and fluid for several hours during their process of coming into the ED? And then I might believe the reading. And then I'll say, we dipped the urine. Why did you dip the urine? Well, it smelt, they smelt a bit. Um, and then they found a UTI. And I'm sure you will all know, I don't need to tell you all in this room. And as Michelle was saying, we overtreat these patients. So if they can tell me whether they have symptoms of a urinary tract infection or they have signs of a sepsis, I will treat them. But generally speaking, I don't give blanket treatment for these patients. Use your assessments areas, buy a bit of time, think about what you're doing. Do they really need to come into hospital? Because I can guarantee you, majority of them, we will not be doing them any favours. My final point is another relatively controversial one. We have many patients coming in from care homes who are bedbound with dementia, with advanced disease, who have a do not resuscitate order. Many of, my, uh, many of these patients get put into our resuscitation room, and I fundamentally think that is the wrong thing for those patients. They are approaching the end of their life, and we need to respect and manage that, and work with the family, and work with their uh, close friends, and with the patients themselves to manage that situation. I do not believe that these patients should be over-investigated and over-resuscitated. And I think that uh, we need to take responsibility with patients for that. They often look to us for advice. And it's very sexy at the moment for saying patients need to make the decisions and you know, they need to drive their treatment and all this kind of thing. But actually, if you ask patients, they'll say, what do you think, doctor? What would you do? Put yourself in their shoes, put yourself in their family's shoes. And it may be actually the more difficult thing to do, to say, do you know what? I think we need to reach a ceiling for how far we're going to go with the treatment. Communication is key here, but we will not be doing these patients any favours. We will be clogging up our departments unnecessarily with patients who are being over-investigated and over-treated when they simply have reached the end of the road. You may disagree with me, but I, uh, the College have produced a document recently, which is really helpful, I think, to guide us in the UK, certainly, around what we should do about the DNAR order. Thank you for listening, and I'd be interested in your comments. So now everyone is really interested in geriatric <laughs> emergency medicine and frailty. It's uh, the sexiest thing, I think, on Twitter right now. The question is, how do we get more buy-in? How do we make people as excited as we are right now? I think we need to go out there and spread the message. I mean, I want it to become our culture because this is, as, as I said, this is our bread and butter. And so um, we need to enthuse about this with our trainees with our medical students, and we need to do more research. Uh, so, you know, there aren't many of us doing active research at the moment, but this is one of my passions. But certainly, on our day-to-day -day business, when we are dealing with others, we need to, and the, the nursing staff as well, we really need to tell them how important this is, and, and, and tell them to put themselves in the shoes of that family. Um, we, we, we need to handle situations sensitively, carefully. Expectations are very high of what we can deliver, but we need to sometimes manage that down in a very sensitive and careful way, but also to make it satisfying for us as clinicians in dealing with those patients. Uh, one last question. Should people with DNRs be in the resuscitation room? 
Be where? In the resuscitation room. Well, personally, I think not. Um, but I, I get looks of horror in my department if I say, I'm sorry, that patient needs to go somewhere else so that we can manage them more sensitively. Um, occasionally, uh, this is not a you know, this is not a black and white situation. Very occasionally, there is, a, there is a role for the resuscitation room with someone with a DNAR order. But personally, I think that that decision has been made with the family. A discussion's been had. It is therefore, I think, confusing, upsetting, and distressing for us to suddenly go in there, all guns blazing, and start pulling all the stops out to try and resuscitate somebody who is approaching the end of their life. So I wouldn't do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.